All right, welcome. Glad to see you all tonight and maybe in the morning. Certainly glad for you joining us. We're going to be covering a, a very uh, important subject, and that is discussing how it is the case that the Bible truly is, in, is inspired of God. And one of the great ways of knowing that is the unity of the Bible. And specifically, we'll be looking at an example tonight where we see how John, the New Testament author, used the Old Testament book, Ezekiel. And I find it just very fascinating, um, this subject, and I, I hope that you will benefit from it as well. So let's get started. So you'll remember in the background of Ezekiel, that he was a captive. He was taken from Jerusalem to Babylonian captivity. And so God appears in a Babylonian setting and uh, calls him to be a prophet. We see that he has a vision. It's a really interesting vision. I urge you to read it, chapter 1 of Ezekiel, where he sees a revelation of God's glory. And uh, it's very very just fascinating to look and fascinating to study. But the whole point of this vision is that God is offended by what Israel has done in that they have broken the covenant over and over again, and God had to send them into exile. And so God calls to Ezekiel, and he's going um, to be a prophet to a very rebellious house. There are going to be people with sadly, a hardened heart. And uh, so it's very important uh, that of what Ezekiel's task is going to be laid out before him. And then we see how Ezekiel performs some what we call sign acts. Uh, he does these demonstrations, and we'll talk about that later on. And basically, it's an overview of the nation's sins against God. And you have to remember, uh, in the timeline uh, that's occurring, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 has not j j happened just yet. Uh, you'll We find that actually occurs in, I think, chapter 24. Then we see as a case, another vision occurs with Ezekiel and that he, uh, God gives him this vision and he sees a picture of a defiled temple because sadly the people, the leaders had desecrated the temple of God. And so we see the glory of God actually come out from the from the most holy place, right? And starts to head out, goes over the Mount of Olives. And you can read that in chapters 8 through 11. And then there's some more detailed description of the nation's sins and why God had to abandon the temple. And then in chapter 16 and 23, we see these extended metaphors how... Um, for example, God finds the Israel as a baby, and basically the baby grows up, it becomes a it becomes a woman, and in a sense, God marries her, makes a covenant with her, and then sadly, the the woman commits adultery, which is showing that basically a figurative expression of uh, going after idolatry, and so that's what we see in chapter sixteen and twenty three. And then there's judgment enacted according to the standards of the nations, where we see that God, um, he not only punishes Israel, but he's also going to punish other nations for what they have done, such as Tyre, for example. We find them in Ezekiel 26 through 28. But then there's that restoration of Israel that starts to begin. And this covers from about 25 through 48. In chapter 37, we find another vision where basically it's a valley of dry bones. And the question is asked, can these bones live? And we see that the bones start to come together and flesh starts to come back upon it. And basically it's the nation of Israel being revived again. It's a promise of unity. And then we see that there's a curse of being left unburied, reversed, and placed upon the nations in uh, chapter 38 and 39. And I'll be honest, um, I don't know exactly what those chapters are uh, specifically about. It's a very interesting subject to talk about Gog and Magog. Um, I can tell you what it's not. 
you know, sometimes we can tell things by what they're not. And I don't uh, think it's referring to the premillennial um, type stuff. Um, I know that for certain. And then there's peace and security that's achieved. And then chapters 40 through 48, another great vision. And man, it's probably one of the most uh, difficult ch chapters in all of the Bible. But what I think uh, partially what's going on here, um, since it's looking forward to the Messianic age, then God wanted through, to, through Ezekiel to kind of use old covenant type language to describe the uh, what's going to uh, happen in the New Testament. Uh, that's what I think is going on. So whenever it, um, well, uh, I don't want to use an example. So that's, I'm just going to keep it like that. So it's not going to be a rebuilt physical temple um, uh, or anything like that. Um, it's talk, we're, we'll, we'll get into more of what it's talking about. But it talks about also God's return, God's return of glory. And so we'll, we'll get into that more. So then there's restoration, completion, and that there is temple reconstruction and the return of Yahweh. Now, um, and then there's the Yahweh in the covenant land of Jerusalem, and it's renamed the Lord is there, Yahweh is there. And I, I got this uh, graph from Brian Peterson's book, John's Use of Ezekiel, page 22. Um, and and it's a very interesting book. I don't agree with everything that he wrote, but um, I think it's very, and this, and this is a graph that I kind of made, and I thought uh, it might help you to understand how John is connected to Ezekiel. So we got the prologue in John 1 through 1 through 18, and I love how John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And we start to see the return of God's glory, right? Jesus, he's the true glory of God. And then uh, there's John 2, 13 through 22. Now, I'll go ahead and say that I believe there are two temple cleansings in the Bible. Uh, the synoptics focus on the one at the end. John focuses on the one at the beginning. And um, he certainly wants to... Um, uh, theologically, uh, he is, uh, you know, I, it's sad to me that there are a lot of scholars out there who think that John is not historically accurate, but John is historically accurate in every way. So there's history, but there's also some theolo theology built upon history. And John definitely has this consistent theological framework he's working in in that he wants to connect things back to the Old Testament like Ezekiel. And so you have Jesus, just like there was a picture of the defiled temple that Ezekiel saw. Well, Jesus also is going to deal with the defiled temple, and what he's going to do is cleanse it. And we see, uh, of course, 40 years later, after 30 AD, what happens? Herod's temple is going to be a ban Well, Herod's temple, I mean... Think about it this way. In Matthew's account, it says Jesus left the temple. That shows you that the gl true glory of God left the temple. God's presence was no longer there. And then 40 years later, it was destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. And then John 3 through 12, we have Jesus and his I am statements. And I think it's really interesting to read about that. And you have Jesus bringing some of Israel back to himself. There are those who have good and honest hearts who do actually repent, and they do repent as uh, repent and believe in the gospel. And we see a lot of them undergoing the baptism of John for the remission of sins and so on. Uh, in John 13 through 17, we see the reviving of the nation through the apostles by of course, the Holy Spirit empowering the, the apostles, as we'll see in Acts 2. And there's Jesus' prayer of unity. So Jesus is with his 12 disciples, and he is giving them this discourse. And uh, it's very, very, uh, it's one of the most um, uh, emotional, uh, to me, one of the most emotional scenes in all the Bible, uh, emotional chapters in all the Bible, because he says to them, you know, I'm going to be leaving you. 
but don't worry. I have, you're going to have an advocate, another advocate that's going to help you, which will be the Spirit. And we see that there's the curses that start to be in reverse. You know, in Deuteronomy, uh, there was the curses for Israel who broke the covenant. Well, those curses will start to be, re be reversed. And then John 18 through 21, there's the rebuilt temple of Jesus, who's Jesus himself, because he comes back from the dead. And he is the one who, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the curse of the church is the body of Christ. And we can all have access to Jesus and be in Jesus by trusting him and obeying the gospel. And we're added by him to his church, to his body, to the temple of God. And so it's very exciting to see that. So then there's that restoration completion that Jesus rose from the dead. And he is the glory of God, in a sense, did return. But as we'll talk about, there is this um, already but not yet eschatology that's going on with John. We'll see that at the very end. So let's talk a little bit more deeper about this. So chapters 1 through 3 of Ezekiel. We see a vision of an offended deity, the call of Ezekiel, and we see the prologue in John 1, 1 through 18. So um, what you see, uh, very interesting when you read Ezekiel 1, uh, you will see the case where there's these uh, weird, these animals. Um, it's very interesting to uh, read. Um, so let me... Uh, let me just go there real quick. Uh, well, you can read those, and there's these four faces. Well, when you read it in its original context, what you got to understand is, um, let me, uh, I got to go there. So let me go there. Okay. Yeah, go to Ezekiel 1. Um, let's go down a little bit. And from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. As for the lightness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had a face of an ox on the left side, each of the four had the face of an eagle. The, those were their faces. And, and what I want you to realize is that this imagery was actually used in, um, in Babylonian uh, culture, that these were their, their gods, their four gods fitted these uh, creatures. But here's what Ezekiel's trying to uh, get across to us from this vision that he saw God. And it is God, that's who is actually in control. You know, it's the point that's the point is that you didn't you don't see the Babylonian gods. You see the true and living God, the God of Israel, of course, the God of the whole world, Jesus uh, God, well, Jesus. <laughs> Who will be well? The name Jesus will come later, but we know him to be deity as well. Uh, so God is in control even over Babylon. God is not just God over the land of Israel; He's God of the whole world. He's even there with the exiles. And then how that fits in is that you know God created all things. The Word, which is what we who, who we know as Jesus, He's the one that created all things. John one verse three. And I love how there's the word of the Lord came, found 50 times through Ezekiel. And I think it's interesting that Jesus is the word who delivers God's words. He becomes God in the flesh, John 1, 14. And then we see this light motif. So if you read Ezekiel 1, 4, for example, I'll, I'll read that for you. Ezekiel 1, 4 says, um, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the mist of the fire. 
And then you can also look at verses uh, 13, 14, 27, and 28. And notice how John, he uses the light motif, right? Uh, and that he shows that Jesus is the one who is the true light. He is the light of the world. And then you see how in Ezekiel eight twelve there were people who were practicing their evil deeds. They were practicing in darkness. And, but the light, the true light in John exposes our dark deeds. It exposes us for who we are. John three nineteen through 21. We see Ezekiel serve as a witness for God's vision of glory. And then we see John the Immerser, who serves as a witness to the true light, which is Jesus. We see Ezekiel is rejected by the Israelites, chapter 2 and 3. Well, sadly, Jesus, he's rejected by the Jews. He came to his own, and they received him not. We see Yahweh dwelling in their midst in a foreign land, Ezekiel 11, verse 16. I'll read that. Therefore say, say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. But then we have Jesus, and he's dwelling in their midst in Israel. John 1.14 We see the glory of Yahweh, and how that vision shows his glory and who, how great he is. Well, think about who Jesus is. We saw, we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. We also see the the sign, uh, furthermore, some sign acts in an overview of the nation's sins. And then we, we find, we see how John, he, he also uses signs. Now, there is a difference in that in Ezekiel's time, it was just demonst- physical demonstrations to try to teach a lesson to Israel. But, in John, what we're going to see, except for one, all of these ones that are done are miracles or supernatural acts from Jesus. But the similarity is there is a prophetic symbolic action with each of these. There, It's pointing to something. So uh, Ezekiel is trying to get uh, the exiles to realize something. And John is trying to get us to realize something that these many other signs did Jesus do in the presence of disciples. But he did these, why? So that you might believe that he is the Son of God and that you might have life in his name. So the signs that Ezekiel has is Ezekiel drawing the city on a brick and laying siege, Ezekiel lying on his side, Ezekiel eating rations over dung, Ezekiel cutting his hair, Ezekiel mimicking going into exile, Ezekiel not mourning his wife's death, the opening of Ezekiel's mouth, and the unifying of the two sticks. What we see in the gospel accounts, except for that one in red, which, which are we see are all, all of them are miracles. So turning the water into wine, casting out the money changers from the temple, healing the nobleman's son, the healing of the lame man, feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water, healing of the blind man, the raising of Lazarus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the miraculous catch of fish. So with um, interesting to me, um, you know, I, after these sign acts are done, we see how John follows through with showing the temple cleansing in John 2, the first one, the first cleansing, I might say, and how that that links back to what Ezekiel saw, the defiled temple. So notice these sign acts. So Ezekiel drawing the city of Jerusalem on a brick and laying siege against it kind of reminds me of Lego, so to speak. Um, and then there's Jesus' action, how he lays spiritual siege against Jerusalem and its temple because he's uh, whipping those animals. He's, uh, you know, clearing, overturning the tables. He's saying, you've turned my house and my father's house into a den of robbers. And so he drives the people away. Uh, we see how Ezekiel's lying on his side in chapter 4, 4 through 6. And what's interesting is you can read about how the priests and the Levites were to bear the iniquity of the nation as spiritual representatives. And Ezekiel, a priest, he does this. He bears the iniquity of the nation. Now, he, of course, doesn't take away the sin of the nation. But we see this ultimately points to Jesus because it's Jesus. It's through him, through his perfect work on the cross, that he bears the iniquity of the world and that he can, he is the one who can take away our sins. Then we have um, the Ezekiel eating rations over dung, 
him cutting his hair and mimicking, mimicking going to exile. All those are kind of referring to is Israel and is enduring the curses of the covenant for breaking it. And then we see the miracles that Jesus did of healing the gnomon's son, the healing of the lame man, healing of the blind man. Jesus provides for his people everything they need. And that, and that Jesus can indeed heal us. Um, us he, well, I mean, he healed us. Um, I'm sorry, let me put it this way. He uh, can heal us spiritually, friends, of our sins. He is the great physician. Um, then we have Ezekiel, who he's told not to mourn his wife's death. And we see how that would correspond with the raising of Lazarus. And that, you know, that would be very important to Ezekiel because that's his wife. And we see how Jesus, I mean, Lazarus, he was, he was very important to, to Jesus. He was his friend. We see it was known before even the death occurs that uh Ezekiel knew that his wife would die, and even and Jesus also knew Lazarus would die. We see that the sign and the symbol to the future uh, destruction of the temple, unfortunately, is that where the wife's death is pointing to. Well, that's what's going to also occur for Jesus too, and that he, uh, the resurrection of Lazarus that ultimately points to Jesus' resurrection. Because Jesus is going to be the, he's the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. And because of what Jesus did, we will all be raised physically from the dead. Chapter 2, verse 19. We see that, um, because remember how Jesus, he said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. He was speaking of the temple of his body. So that's something that we need to recognize. Um. Now, remember that Ezekiel is not allowed to weep, but Jesus, he's the one that can reverse the weeping because we can be reunited with those who have been faithful to Christ. And think about our loved ones who have gone on, who are faithful to Christ, we will be able to meet them again. And so Jesus has reversed the weeping. Also, we see in... Um, that sadly, because of the defiled temple, um, that the temple was abandoned by God. So we see Herod's, you know, in John's time, uh, Jesus, he also, he left the temple and left it to be destroyed because for Ezekiel, the priesthood had to file the precincts, chapter 8. This desecration caused God's glory to leave, and the temple was now left to its demise by the Babylonians in 586. Um, we see God promised to be a sanctuary among the outcast, and a new spirit would be given to the people. And what's uh, really interesting to me, uh, this does have to do with John 3 and John 4. Um, we're to worship God in spirit and in truth, uh, being born of water and spirit. Um, in Ezekiel 18, it actually tells us, uh, let, me, let me go there, I want to show you all something. Ezekiel 18. Look at what it says here. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent. This is a command. Turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from all the tran cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? You see, the word of God convicts us. It convicts a sinner to, to, to repent and turn from his evil ways and to turn to God, and God will forgive. And so that's why it can be said that God gives us a new heart and a new spirit because we have chosen to do what's right. We've chosen to obey God's will. Um, so I just want to bring that out. So I want you to think about how for John, Jesus is the true temple of God. We see that all throughout John. It's really amazing to see that 
take place. And I'd love for you to read my volume uh, 115 that just came out, Voice of Truth. And I talk about this theme of the temple. And Jesus had the right to cleanse the temple because he had authority. He's God. And the desecration caused Jesus, whose deity, to leave. He did that again also in Matthew 21. So the temple would be left to its demise by the Romans in AD 70. We see uh, how it is the case. Um, there's a detailed description of the nation's sins. And then in chapter 16 and 23, there's those two extended metaphors of showing how Israel broke the covenant. We see that also other nations will be judged for what they did. And now let's look at how um, there's Jesus and his I am statements and how Jesus bringing some of Israel back to himself, those who chose to come back, those who chose to live right. So I think it's really interesting how Emi is used 141 times in the New Testament. It's used 54 times in the Johannine literature, First John, First John, Second John, Third John, and Revelation. 45 times refers to Jesus, and there's 38 times where the emphatic use means that it's really emphasizing, I, I am. And I think it's interesting how you find in Ezekiel, it says, then you shall know that I am the Lord God. You shall know that I am the Lord God. I think it's really interesting uh, terminology there. You see it here too. Um, so who is Jesus? He is the I am. He is eternal. He is one of the members of the Trinity, of the Godhead. You know, he asked himself, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the other prophets. No, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's so interesting that Jesus says, I am the bread of life in John 6. Uh, you find how he says that over and over again. I am the bread of life. And I think it's interesting how that refers back to Exodus 16. So how that would refer to Ezekiel's time is that Ezekiel, um, you know, the, it's it's being attacked. Jerusalem is being attacked by the Babylonians. So there's these essentials that were needed, like bread and water. But there's going to be a famine now, and there is the necessity of bread and water. Well, we see as a case that Jesus is calling us that there's great, there's greater sustenance than physical food, and that is spiritual food. That is what we need to see. Um, so you can read that in these passages of Scripture if you like for yourself. Jesus brings true substance in the Messianic age. God would bring an end to famine. Ezekiel 34, 29, I'll raise up. For them a garden of renown, they should no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 29, 30, I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. I will call for the grain and multiply it. Bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees, increase your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then Jesus also said, I am the light of the world, right? Uh, we see that as the case in this passage. I think it's interesting when you read Ezekiel 12, 1 through 15. Uh, it's really interesting what we read about. And uh, it says, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, ears to hear, but does not hear, for they're a rebellious house. Therefore, son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity and go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from your place into captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. By day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight, as though going into captivity. And at evening you shall go in their sight, like those who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight, and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders, and carry them out at twilight. You shall carry your face, so that you cannot see the ground. For I made you a sign to the house of Israel. So I did as I was commanded. I brought out my belongings by day, as though going into captivity. And at evening I dug through the wall with my hand. I brought them out at twilight. I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning of the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, What are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, This burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem, which was Zedekiah, and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am assigned to you, as I have done, so it shall, shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity, and the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. He shall 
cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will also spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. It's really interesting because we know that his eyes were, were plucked out. I will scatter to everyone all who are around him to help him and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from their sword, from famine, and from pestilence, so that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So we see that Ezekiel Sinai partially performed at, in the dark right at twilight. Zedekiah the prince attempted to escape. The people were made to defend themselves. The king was to be a leader, a guide. But Judah's kings, they failed. But the Messianic king will not fail. You know, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, but he never failed. John 9, 5, it deals with both literal and spiritual blindness. And Jesus speaks about the spiritual blindness of the leaders. So I think it's interesting how Jesus performs a sign in John 9. Ezekiel performs a sign act. Uh, John 9, you know, there's that day and night motif used. And then there's day and night motif used in Ezekiel 12. Blind man gained his sight. Zedekiah sadly lost his sight, physical sight. People don't to believe. People don't, and same thing in Ezekiel. And judgment was given for spiritual blindness for in both parts. Um, so we need to keep our focus on Jesus. He will not lead us astray. He is indeed the light of the world. Let's not walk in darkness. Jesus is the only way of entering to gain the blessings of the new covenant because he said, I am the door. We see that in John 10, 1 through 16. I'll let you read that for yourself. We see that Ezekiel and Jeremiah had to battle it out against these false prophets, as you see. And they'll lead, false prophets will lead us astray. False teachers will lead us astray. Sadly, there were those priests who instituted idolatry and worship of Tamas, an idol. They gave false direction. There was talisman and divination that was used. And then we got I, Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing to see that Jesus being that good shepherd. And that's definitely a call back to Ezekiel chapter 34. And I would love for you to read chapter 34. It talks about how there was these false shepherds who did not help the people, the sheep. But there is a good shepherd coming, David, who is the Messiah type of the Messiah who will come and help. And so I'd love for you to read Ezekiel 34. It's amazing how it, it fits with John 10, Psalm 23, also Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. And then I am the good resurrection and the life, Jesus said, right? John 11, 20 through 27. I love these verses because we know that, you know, Death is not the end. Physical death is not the end. Uh, we can know and have assurance that God, those who have passed on, and think about some of those who have gone on before me who were my friends, brethren in Christ. I think about John Biddle, for example. One day I want to see him again, raised from the dead, uh, in that new glorified body. Well, it's all because of Jesus. He's the resurrection and the life. And so in John 5, 24 through 30, we see there's spiritual life talked about at the very first. And then there's, there's going to be physical life, right? We're going to be brought back from the dead. So that's why it says, Most truly I say to you, he who hears my word, believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most truly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. No doubt, going back to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And then we see Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Um, we see um, how in John 1, 4, he is the life, right? It's used 47 times in John. And Jesus is the way to eternal life and fulfillment in God. 
but we got to turn from our wickedness. That's the only way that we can truly start to live is when we turn from evil and turn to that which is good. And then we see that Jesus is the true vine. And very interesting enough, you should read Ezekiel 15, 1 through 5. And let's look at that. I think it's really interesting what we see there in that passage of Scripture. So Ezekiel 15, 1 through 5. So it says, um, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood, the vine branch which is among the trees of the forest? Is a wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on? Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it, and its middle is burned. It is useful for. Is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? Definitely some allusions to John 15 there. And now, sadly, Israel had become a worthless vine. But you see, Jesus, he's the true Israel. And he is the true vine. And we should desire to abide in him. And I would urge you to read chapter 17, 1 through 21, and 19, 10 through 15. But what can we say with all these uh, I am statements? That Israel was to abide in the covenant. They were to follow the way of God, and if they did so, it would bring life. But they, unfortunately, did not choose to do so. They were to catch a glimpse of the light of Israel, of course, being God himself. They needed to listen to the truth that was taught by the prophet Ezekiel. Israel being in exile was a worthless vine, but there was hope. And then we see as a case that God would resurrect them from their metaphorical graves to a blessed and rejuvenated land with a new temple and a good shepherd to lead them. The people would come to the door of the new temple and bask in living water that brings life. Do you see how all that connects to today, friends? That Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and life. Jesus is the light of the world. And we must abide in the true vine. And we are resurrected when we undergo water immersion for the remission of sins. We put our faith in the operation of God, in the working of God, who will cut off our sins. And someday, our physical bodies will be raised incorruptible if we should die in this life. We, will in, we enter into the new temple, the body of Christ, the church of Christ, when we obey the gospel. We allow that great shepherd to lead us and we, when we follow and listen to his voice. And we must enter into the door and we must partake of the bread of life. And then we see that there are some visions that correspond to this vision of the revised, na revived nation and the promise of unity. And how that fits with John 13 through 17. How God wants to revive us through the apostles by way of the Holy Spirit and the prayer of unity. So think about this way. You read Ezekiel 37, talking about that valley of dry bones. There's a graveyard. And in John 20, Jesus was laid in a tomb. Then in Ezekiel 37, there was a obviously a former battle that had taken place in that Israel had fought with Nebuchadnezzar and lost. And there were many people who died or who were sent off into exile. And thus they were cursed. We see as a case that when you leave soldiers' bodies on the battlefield, that's a testimony that, hey, the, the conqueror of the conqueror's might, right? We see how Jesus, he was buried before sundown because you remember that they wanted to follow God's law. Uh, John nineteen thirty one. let me read that for you. John 19, 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So, according to Deuteronomy 21, every man who is hung on a tree is cursed. Now, here's the thing. It would seem, and I emphasize seem, as if Jesus was cursed. 
And we know that the devil had the power of death, according to Hebrews 2, I think 17 and 18, it showed a testimony to his might. Uh, John 12, 37. But although, um, oops, that's not the word. That's not what I'm looking for. Oops. Hey, if, Maybe I meant verse 31 now is the judgment of this world. Now the rule of this world will be cast out. Um, I mean, it seemed like the devil had one, you know, Jesus there being dead for three days. But then there's a resurrection that takes place in Ezekiel's vision, right? The reversal of the curse of death. And then, of course, that also in regards to Jesus, that he rose from the dead because the physical death was a consequence of sin. Genesis 3, Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15. And so Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then there's a curse of non-burials removed from Israel and placed and set upon her enemies in chapter 39. And then, interesting enough, that Ezekiel gives a veiled response to that question, can these bones live? And remember that Thomas, he does desire to have evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And then there's the vision that shows a future hope of a return of Israel as a nation. And this great historical event, John 20, shows the future hope of all being risen from the dead. And I think it's also interesting that Ezekiel says this, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Uh, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them and shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. So this covenant of peace, and I think it's interesting how that's used uh, in John chapter 20. And I just want to show you some verses there. John 20, this covenant of peace, because God, Jesus is going to establish a new covenant, friends. 14, 27, 16. Um, yeah, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to, peace to you, as the Father sent me, I also send you. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And and this peace, uh, we know it, it not only extends to the apostles, but also to us who are followers of Christ. We have the peace that passes all understanding, being a part of that new covenant. It's an exciting thing to think about. And then we see the case, uh, Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28, talks about the two sticks, which is not the Bible in the Book of Mormon. I'll go ahead and say that. It is represents Judah and Ephraim. Ephraim being the northern tribe, representing the northern kingdom. Judah representing the southern kingdom, how they be reunited together. And I think it's interesting how there's this unity, prayer of unity, so the divided nation will be one again, and Jesus prays for the unity of the church. John 17, 11, 21, and 22. God will give the nation into the care of one king, which is David, which, of course, we know it can't be the, uh, you know, it can't be David reincarnated. David had died 400 years prior to this. So it's referring to the Messiah, Jesus. And the Father gives the church into the hand of Jesus, the, the true, the Messiah, the son of David. And then we see that God will be the God of Israel, and the Father is the God of the church. The United Nation will be purified. The church is sanctified through the word. The God will have communion with his people, and the disciples have communion with God. God is with the nation eternally, and eternal life is promised to the church. And we are the new Israel, Galatians 6, 16. United Israel will cause the world to know that Yahweh is God. And this is the thing, friends, a unified church will be an example to the world that they may believe. And that's the sad part about what's going on in our religious environment is that 
There's thousands and thousands of different denominations, isn't there? Friend, denominations didn't exist in the first century, and we don't have to be a part of any man-made denominations. We can go back to the Bible and do exactly what God wants us to do. We can be exactly like those people were on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And anyone who says otherwise hasn't really considered the seed principle because God can plant the seed in a good and honest heart over two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 200 years, 2,000 years even. And the United Nation will follow Yahweh's laws. That's what we see, that we are to indeed be united on the Word of God. And that's what we need to submit to, friends. That's how we have true unity. So I hope you can see here in uh, chapter 40 through 48, we see the vision of that rebuilt temple and Yahweh's return. And it's a very beautiful picture of how John sees Jesus. He's the true rebuilt temple of God. And Jesus returned from the grave, and Jesus is glorified. Jesus, he replaces that physical temple. He is the locus of God's presence and glory and revelation and abundant provision. In him, we have life and everything that we need. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And those of us who will obey the gospel, who trust Jesus with all of our heart, will say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, as Peter would say to us, repent and be baptized in every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so we need to do what God commands of us, that we are to believe he is the Son of God, repent of our past sins, confess our faith in him, and be immersed for remission of sins. And we are also to live a faithful life. We can walk that, we can walk a life of faith and that's a great thing. You know, people think this is so burdensome. That's why I was listening to this video and they kept on saying, oh, that's so burdensome. Wait a minute. For this is the love of God that we could keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. First John 5 verse 3. And so I'm so thankful to be a part of this new Israel, this, this being resurrected. And then if I should die physically, being resurrected uh, physically from the grave and being able to be with Jesus forever. Uh, when, and so uh, it's just exciting. It's exciting to see Ezekiel and John and the unity of the Bible and see all these themes just come together. I hope that you um, have been, uh, I hope that you've been uh, blessed as I am and Think about these things here and just uh, just really exciting. And like I said, John, he teaches an already but not yet eschatology. We're still awaiting the second coming of Jesus. There is a future general bodily resurrection from the dead. And there's that future general judgment coming. But friend, you and I need to be, be prepared. Because you see, when Jesus returns, Second Thessalonians 1 says, those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ... Those who do not know God, these are going to be punished uh, with everlasting uh, fire and they'll be, be uh, taken away from the presence of the Lord. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to come to the knowledge of the truth and I hope that you'll want to become a Christian. Really thankful for you to um, listening to this. I really appreciate it. And I want to say to you, God bless you tonight. Uh, if you want to study, be glad to do so. Bye-bye.